Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. It used to be said that there were only three ways Albany legislators left office, death, indictment, or becoming a judge. Well, in the last decade, fully 28 assembly members and senators have left office under a criminal or ethical cloud, and there are four more facing charges, including recently deposed assembly speaker Sheldon Silver. That is, four more, that is far more standing in front of a judge than those who have assumed the bench. Governor Cuomo has now called for comprehensive ethics reform to end the culture of secrecy that has fed that corruption. He has called for full disclosure of legislators' outside income, threatened convicted lawmakers with the loss of their pensions, moved to crack down on the, on the abuse of per diem lawmakers, get when they are on the job, and called for campaign finance reform. Other ethics reformers have targeted member items, which have in some cases gone to groups that hire or are totally answerable to the members who provide them with taxpayer dollars. Lawmakers have lashed back at the governor, wondering whether the advances he got for his poor-selling memoir should be targeted, and even calling for his, for his, for his live-in girlfriend to be subject to, to financial disclosure requirements she would face if they were married. And the governor came under withering criticism last year for suddenly disbanding a special, a special anti-corruption commission, a, a so-called Moreland Commission, that he had formed in order to investigate legislative ethics, just as it appeared in press reports to be extending its look into the executive branch as well. It's all part of what ethics mavens point to as the unsavory link between lobbyist-driven campaign contributions and special interest legislation that too, that too often overrides what critics of the current system call the public interest. It's unlikely we'll see the kind of, of progressive campaign system of limited contributions and limited campaign spending that has vastly improved, though not perfected, politics in the city. I guess it's worthy of note that the city council has a far lower conviction rate than the legislature. Does all of this matter to the man and woman in the street? What are the costs of corruption? Is it possible to curb it in a system in which virtually no incumbent gets turned out of office by the voters since those, since those lawmakers control how their districts get formed anyway? Does ethics reform matter if the rules of the game are not changed to ensure better representatives among the majority of legislators, of uh, legislators who do an honest job for their constituents? We're joined by four prominent New Yorkers with varying views on whether we face, a, face an ethics crisis and what we should do about it. Dick Dady is the executive director of the Citizens Union. Ken Sherrill is professor emeritus of political science at Baruch College. Michael Benjamin is a former assemblyman from the Bronx who is now, among other things, a columnist for the New York Post. And L. Joy Williams is a veteran Democratic political consultant who just arrived back from Albany just before this taping. You, you, since you just came back from Albany, kind of the belly of the beast, <laughs> do you, is, there a sense of, is there a sense of besiegement, if I can coin a word? Do, do, is, is this ethics focus being felt? You know, I can't say that walking through the halls and, you know, in the chamber that there seemed to be either from the legislators or the folks that were... Um, there to persuade their legislators one way or the other on their particular issues, that they felt um, some uneasiness um, or felt that someone was coming to serve papers at any given moment. Um, I think for the most part, um, people were going about the business as usual in Albany, which generally happens. Anytime um, we circle around and have these points of uh, crisis, as they're called, um, you know, pe uh, there's a majority of people sort of going on as business business as usual. Um, and that's what, you know, the sense was today. You know, there were still lobbyists uh, <laughs> lobbying. There were still uh, interest groups there. There were still elected officials, um, some of who um, may have some cloud maybe following them, but it certainly did not permeate through um, the rest of the chamber or Albany. Michael, you served up there. Mm -hmm. um, how conscious is the, and how, how conscious are lawmakers about this kind of ethics focus? Are they is there a circle of the wagons? Is it uh, turning on each other? I mean, what's, what's the kind of culture now, I would within say the legislature? Two years ago, when it became evident that, that Nelson Castro, from the Bronx, was wired for, for three or four years in the legislature, when they heard about that, they were nervous about who was, uh, uh, whether other members were wired. They, they joked about having meetings in a sauna so they could see who was wired. Um, <laughs> but I think the issue now, I think, is their leader has been indicted. I think that's a whole different matter. I think many members were chastened. Um, about corruption. I think the fact that uh, Shelley Silver has been indicted, I think that sends a different kind of a chill. I think many other members, as you notice, it took uh, less than a couple of weeks to get him out. 
And when he wanted to stay, there was a this, this, this quick turnover to make to make Carl Heasty the uh, the next speaker. So I think they're beyond that now. They they want to work towards some sort of compromise with the governor when it comes let's, when it comes to uh, ethics reform. I think many good members want ethics reform. It's just what will it look like, and will they be the only ones to whom it will appear? They're the ones who are really the bad guys because they, they want to look at the governor too. Because there are things the governor has an ability to do, whether he's rewarding his contributors or not directly, it can have that same kind of taint. Uh, Dick, you've been at this business for an awful long time. Um, is the, um, is the, the, the ethics crisis uh, setting the stage where things might finally get done? I would hope so. Uh, we've seen many previous attempts uh, made that have not fully succeeded. There have been half loaves. You know, in 2011, uh, when Governor Cuomo was first elected, uh, there was a huge ethics reform package that was passed that did include joint oversight of the legislative branch and the executive branch that provided some independent enforcement of our new ethics laws. And actually, that has helped lead to... Was that, was, was that Jacob? Uh, that helped create Jacob, uh, but also uh, it actually helped lead to the uh, problems for Shelley Silver because he was uh, required now to disclose outside income and did so incorrectly by not disclosing all of it. Uh, we have this veil of secrecy that exists in Albany. Uh, a lot of what state government is involved in is not transparent or publicly available. For example, a lot of the committee meetings and hearings that take place in Albany and the Assembly are not webcast. Uh, they are in the Senate. Uh, it's this veil of secrecy that has created this culture of corruption that has led to this crime wave that you alluded to at, earlier in the show, where 28 legislators uh, in the last 15 years have been forced from office as a result of criminal misconduct or ethical charges. And there are another four under indictment. I think New Yorkers have reached a point uh, where they can no longer accept a half a loaf. And I'm hopeful that given the governor's strong stand, although we don't necessarily agree with everything that he's proposing and how he's proposing to accomplish it. But I think, as, as Michael has said, this has really woken up uh, many in the legislature to realize that we need to do something big here, and I hope that we will. I want to come back to the secrecy question in a second, but uh, Ken, why should um, why should the average New Yorker care about this? That's you know, uh, if you look at polls, people are more concerned about rent regulation. They're more concerned about substantive issues, if you will, as a, to, the, to the degree that ethics is a process issue. You know, I, I don't want to say it's not a substantive issue, but there are, there are other issues that are more compelling that affect people's daily lives. Does this ethics crisis affect people's daily lives? I remember the election in Louisiana where a convicted felon was running for governor against the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And there were bumper stickers all over the place that said, vote for the crook. And, uh, you, you know... That was Edwin Edwards versus David Duke. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that some of that is going on in Albany, sort of the mirror image of it, which is that we have correctly been so obsessed with corruption in Albany uh, that we have been looking the other way at the general failures of the political process in Albany, the culture of secrecy, certainly. The fact that we have a legislature in which the legislative process does not occur, I think, is, is, is perhaps really critical. Uh, the, the bizarre powers of the governor. Uh, there are, you know, the whole malapportionment of the state. The, but the, the fact, really, that there is no legislative process in Albany is the biggest single problem. And I fear that people are going to think that by solving the corruption problem, we've solved all of the others. It's not. There are many more problems at Albany than corruption. And, and can, I, can I add Please. to that? I think we're, um, you know, we should bring into the conversation overall. Um, you know, we're talking about the polls in terms of people um, wanting an on-time budget or concerned about rent and, and things like that, sort of more than this corruption question. Um, but we should also bring into the conversation that across the board, not only here in the state, but across the country, there's a, a certain basic level that the average American citizen have in believing that their elected officials are crooked or <laughs> corrupt to begin with.
right? So, you know, there's always that, and that contributes to apathy, that contributes to sort of this feeling that, well, they're all corrupt anyway. Right. Um, and, and so... Which, uh, which, of course, they are not. Right. right. They're not. Right. Um, but that is the general sense, um, and, and, you know, and... and for everyone, you know, whether it's their state elected officials, their, you know, in Congress or even the presidency, that overall people feel that the, the issues of urgency are more of uh, can I afford, you know, to pay rent? Can I afford to feed my right, family? But, what, like that. but to that point, though, when Senator Pedro Espada took over in the coup as the leader of the Senate, he specifically tanked rent, rent regulations. I believe his mm -hmm. entire move was about rent regulations. The indictment against former Speaker Sheldon Silver talks about the use of tax credits and, uh, and development rights for developers because of, of a possible corrupt uh, agreement. So that does affect the lives of, 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 of New Yorkers, whether it's housing or anything else. I think so it does have an effect on how legislation is done. I know for me, I started thinking about things that happened in legislature. I forgot what year it was, that 2007, 2009. Um, the rent regs were about to sunset. We ended session, come back the next day, the day before session was going to end. The Senate stayed in session all night, and they voted a rent regulation that we either had to agree with or, then, or let it expire. So we were stuck to pass a Republican proposal. And I'm thinking, well, did Shelley know about this? And was this part of a deal that we all got suckered into? So you start thinking about how corruption can taint the process and think whether it happens or not, it, it does have an effect. Okay. That's... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of good people serving in Albany. And the unfortunate thing is that the bad people overshadow all the good that gets done. Uh, and I think also the legislative process, which Ken was referring to, uh, stymies good people's intentions. They come up there with great ambitions and a desire to serve the public interest. But because the legislature uh, doesn't operate effectively or efficiently and is so controlled by one person or you know, uh, leaders from each of the two houses. Uh, it deflates, it, it disempowers the individual legislators. And so uh, it does create this culture where people are looking for influence and there are opportunities. You know, I think New Yorkers want to believe in the, their elected officials. Um, and, you know, when uh, things like this happen with Shelley Silver and as, as, as Mike just mentioned, uh, uh, with Pedro Espada, we want to believe that they're acting in the public interest, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, and these kind of acts undermine that public trust. And so it's an opportunity here uh, the governor has and the legislature has to really restore the public trust and to, you know, and, and to bring uh, a sense of trust back into government. Um, well, you know, it's um, uh, Michael Kinsley, the publisher and editor of many, many national publications, had a wonderful saying where he said that the scandal is not what's illegal, the scandal is what's legal. And mm -hmm. I am not, you know, I don't want to prejudge Sheldon Silver's case. I mean, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember Mel Miller. Mel Miller was convicted. You're not the only one who's old enough right, to but remember <laughs> Mel Miller. <laughs> Mel Miller was, was convicted in a case that I thought, I was a reporter covering it, and I thought it was essentially an ethical matter as opposed to a criminal matter, and it was eventually overturned. Um, it's not clear to me that, you know, uh, Silver is, you know, some of the charges against Silver involve this anti-cancer program where, uh, involving asbestos, I believe, where uh, the doctor allegedly was steering uh, plaintiffs through Shelley into his law firm and he was given, he was paid a referral fee. By all accounts, that program is an excellent program. Uh, to me, more interestingly, is the case that you're referring to about uh, people who wanted to get take advantage of, of a number of tax breaks for real estate, who he was referring to um, an individual, this, this small two-person firm that, you know, I assume that Preet Bharara, who's the, you know, rampaging bull of New York politics right now, uh, is going to focus on. It argues to me that that I could draw a link between Silver objecting to greater reporting of who your clients are and where you're making money than arguing about limiting lawmakers' ability to make a living. Mm -hmm. but the, you know, look at that, cancer fund, that supporting cancer research, okay? That was funded out of a slush fund purely out at the uh, disposal of the speaker without going through the legislative process. At member all. items do that as well. All member items essentially do that. Right. Now... What if 
there had been a committee process that produced legislation that said the state of New York was going to underwrite cancer research. I'm afraid nobody would have voted against it. Uh, yeah, there would have been an argument about how much and so on and so forth. Uh, but instead, business that, as usual there is simply, well, he's got this slush fund. We'll let him do what he wants with it as long as he you know, takes care of us. Uh, and and what, 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 what happens is that people become dependent on, on these little bags of money to help this constituent group or that constituent group as they give up any hope of legislating on the substance of politics. Right. But we haven't well, I think had, what did I achieve? We had I helped this five person years, out. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, okay. We haven't had member in, in five years. So it, it wasn't member items themselves that were corrupting. Mm -hmm. It's still individuals who were taking kickbacks for member items or they were putting yeah. their family members on the payroll of the groups mm -hmm. they were sending yeah. money to. Yeah. That's ethically yeah. wrong. That, right. that shouldn't happen. There's a, there's, there's a different process I, I think we need to talk about. It's not just the, the Speaker of the, uh, of the Assembly or, or the Majority Leader of the Senate. It's the Committee Chairman wield extreme power as well. So if mm -hmm. you're a freshman mm -hmm. member and you mm -hmm. have a piece of legislation that you think ought to be, ought to be voted on, you have to convince the chairman of, the, of that committee to do that. Right. And if, you, and if you're not successful, you're not going to get your bill looked at, or he's going to like it so much, or right. she like it so much, they'll make it their own bill. And right. then you get cut out. Right. That's what irritates people. And that's why right. the really smart guys who have ambition eventually move on and try to do something else. And right. I think, uh, because this is not just isolated to our state legislatures, because we can, you know, elevate this conversation to Congress and into other places as well. And I think that, you know, there's corruption everywhere. You know, there, there can be corruption at the, you know, the corner lemonade stand <laughs> between, two, you know, between two seven-year-olds, right? Um, so anyone who is going to actively, um, you know, look to enrich themselves or do anything, whether their rules are in place or not, they're going to find some way to, 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 get, a, to get around that. Um, and even, but there can be unintended consequences on on those things as well, particularly on member items, right? Um, that you know, yes, people use them to get kickbacks and sort of do all of these things. But then think about all of the smaller organizations and other things that do are not able to be involved in that process, who cannot afford to do a lobbyist, who can't afford to do all of this to make sure that their issues and things are heard. Um, the the same thing. So we're also dealing with an antiquated system um, in terms of our. Uh, our our government and our electoral system to begin with as well. And so these change, these birth changes are really long overdue in that we have a democracy or a republic that is old and needs to be pushed um, to change rules for greater in, um, inclusiveness. Um, and so as we're trying to create new uh, strategies for reform um, so that uh, there's transparency, so that there's greater involvement, not only for who is voting in the legislation that gets uh, that we get out of our legislator, but actually who our legislators are, um, that's, an, that's an issue. Because um, even talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, outside income um, as well as what our legislators uh, are paid, it can be an issue of having fair representation um, in the legislature as well. Those who are able to afford independently wealthy and afford mm -hmm. uh, to be able to be legislators, that leaves out a, a number of people um, who are not able to run and sort let of be me, in the process. Let me ask, let me yeah. turn to you on this question because I think it's a very important point, which is um, are we better off with limits on, out, on outside income? Or since I believe that, you know, my bias is I believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant, <clears throat> heightened reporting requirements. I think, it, I think it's everything, Bob. In, uh, including limiting yes, outside I, income. I think, I think, you know, I think the... Uh, um, you know, the member item discussion is illustrative of what we need to avoid doing uh, with this ethics reform. You know, uh, member items were the lifeblood for many community organizations and, mm -hmm. and from our perspective should not have been cut. They should have been reformed. And what, mm -hmm. you don't reform something by ending something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, the, they still exist. They just go through. No, they don't. The government. No. Well, they don't go. <laughs> they're not tied to individual members, but there still is an informal way. Right, uh, and the governor had, think, has, anyway, had total control right. over yes. that. Right, uh, and the le there's very little legislative involvement. Uh, so, but anyway, I think that um, you know, first off, what needs to happen is uh, there needs to be a ban on uh, personal use of campaign contributions. You want to talk about scandal? Uh, what is permitted use of campaign contributions to essentially enrich the lifestyle of individual legislators? Uh, 
you know, I mean, Joe Bruno's pool cover was allowed. You know, lots of activities that are not related to the, cam to the campaign are permitted. So that needs to, you know, we need to limit the use of campaign contributions for personal use. We need to raise the legislative pay. Uh, you know, if we wanted to create a perfect system in which corruption exists, we've got it here in New York by how little we pay the state legislators and how little disclosure there is about outside income mm -hmm. and uh, the, the lack of legislative uh, involvement. So we need to raise the legislators' uh, uh, compensation. We also need to uh, change the way in which per diems uh, are verified. Uh, it's a trust system. It needs to be trust and verified. Three, uh, there needs to be a cap probably on outside income. Uh, but you can't, excuse me, there needs a cap on outside income, but only if you raise the base salary of legislators significantly so that legislators, every New Yorker should want to aspire to be able to serve uh, in the state legislature, but many of them can't because of, they can't raise a family, particularly in New York. Uh, so we need to make that more attractive, and we need to ban certain types of income, outside income. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of it is disclosed, but more disclosure needs to take place. You know, we are speaking, we're taping this on the same day that the report came in that former city councilman uh, Daniel Halloran was sentenced to 10 years in jail yeah. on one of the most operatic corruption conspiracies involving State Senator um, Malcolm Smith, who has also been, who's also been convicted, supposedly trying to buy the Republican nomination yeah. for mayor, and it somehow involved support for a road in Orange County. It's <laughs> one of the most convoluted um, and operatic, although, as I've, as I've said, it's not my favorite. Uh, you, when, you, when you've been a reporter as long as I was, you kind of become a connoisseur of corruption. I still am um, that Assemblyman Boylan was indicted for trying to shake down a developer to raise money to pay his lawyer for the first case in which he was charged with shaking down a developer. So, I mean, there's a certain, you know, you do kind of get to appreciate some of the uh, strangeness. But when you limit outside income, are you limiting the types of people who will, who will run? I mean, in the case of the governor, uh, he got, you know, what, 900000 He has potentially a $900,000 advance on this strange book that he wrote. Um, should that factor into a limit on outside income? Yes. Governor is not covered right now. As I yes. Understand. No. The, the, the problem with some of Governor Cuomo's proposals is that it only applies to the legislature. Mm -hmm. It should apply to everyone serving in state government. And let me, uh, and just to follow up on that, let's talk about the Moreland Commission, which was formed. Do you agree that the, the I mean, the, the, the manner in which that was, they were making progress in terms of investigating acts that they believe were corrupt in the legislature. And the, and the proof of that is that Preet Bharara, the, US, the, the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Manhattan, took those files, was given those files. He didn't have to subpoena them. He was given those files, and it has led to a number of indictments and legal actions. Um, what did that tell us about how, how suspicious are you of the governor's involvement in that? Well, I think, um, you know, the governor... <laughs> It's a tough question. No, not just <laughs> but, 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 but I think in, in general, right, is people, um, particularly in this climate, they're pointing the finger at the legislature, right, because here are examples that I can point to um, from elected members and saying they are corrupt, right? Um, and so to capitalize that on politically, right, is that, yes, I want to reform them, you know, and sort of not sort of in, in, including or even putting forth suggestions on how that can include yourself. Um, and so leaders lead by example. Um, and so that's, you know, starting first with yourself and saying, you know, this, uh, that reform that I'm putting forth that should be beneficial for the entire government and for the entire electorate. I'm going to start with myself. Here's what I suggest with uh, myself. Um, or I want to include myself in sort of this whole reform package that I'm talking about. So, you know, it, it, I think it's a political thing um, because the environment is there to be able to point at someone else or point at another um, branch to say, you know, we need to reform them. The Moreland Commission should not have been shut down. Uh, Preet Bharara's continuing investigation and outcomes show that they were on to something. Uh, you know, the question is whether or not they had the, uh, would, would have withstood the legal challenges that were being made about the execu an executive formed entity reaching into the legislature to get these documents on outside income. Uh, that was a stretch, uh, but he should have stuck to his guns and pushed it. 
uh, you know, to argue that he got something out of the legislature in terms of strengthening the bribery, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the penalties associated with corruption and uh, lessening the definition of what it takes to be involved in a bribe, you know, were all good things, but not good enough to shut down the Moreland Commission. Uh, they were onto something and should not, have, but, should not have ended. But yet what the governor is now doing is he's taken ethics legislation and other legislation, including having to do with teachers' issues and school issues, and plugging them into the budget in such a way that you that these are inextricably linked. I mean, you know, you can't uh, put a measure in to, you know, add safety for pigs to a legislation about housing. That's not the way the government's supposed to work. But yet he has, uh, you know, even people who are who support his ethics proposals, including uh, Bill Hammond today in, in the Daily News, saying he's overreaching. I like his instinct, but he's playing with the Constitution. Well, yeah, it's a complete subversion of the democratic process. I mean, you know, and, and and explain not, that. not that he has any affection for the democratic process. The, the, uh, there has to be room for public input. There has to be debate. There has to be discussion. There has to be serious thought given to this and arguments. And these things are not done because a, a gun is put to your head and a deadline comes. This was, I, I, I think it started with Pataki. It did start with Pataki. It started, you know, putting uh, un, uh, unrelated items uh, into the budget and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, threatening everybody. And the legislature acquiesced. And yeah. the, but the Court of Appeals actually also, in Pataki v. Silver, yes. supported yes. the governor. So that's, that's, right. that's why... Yeah. Governor Cuomo can do this today. Because he That's appointed the those judges. For yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there are two parts, the, and Michael knows this better than anyone. I mean, two parts to the budget process. There's the authorization bills, mm -hmm. and then there's the appropriation bills. It's okay for the governor to put uh, proposed policy and programmatic changes in the author authorizing bills because the legislature has the authority to change those. What they don't have the authority to change is, are the appropriation right, bills, right. which is where we believe too, and I think everyone may, I don't need to speak, has crossed, the governor's crossed a line mm -hmm. by putting them into the appropriation bills because the legislature has no power to change them. Um, I, mean, that I don't know how many people here know this, but for example, tax funding is now tied to all kinds TAP funding of is tap funding is funding you know, your tuition assistance programs uh, is now tied to uh, the Dream Act to uh, tax deductions for contributions to parochial schools to a whole range of things uh, in, that are in that are in the budget and and presumably in tied to ethic reform as well. I mean, you know, you don't do that to a bunch of students who need money. That shouldn't happen. I, I still can't figure out how they managed to tie. Ethics reform into into appropriations. Yeah, right. What's what's the funding mechanism? He actually has done it through the comptroller. It's the it's part of the per diem uh, uh, process and the and the verification. So it's you, about payment of per diems. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go to questions in a in a couple of minutes from from the students here in the audience. Uh, Barara, ha, Preet Barara, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, <laughs> has been uh, kind of operatic in his own way. He has been. Uh, a bit gleeful in public. He frankly reminds some people of the grandstanding of Rudy Giuliani. Um, and we know how that worked out. Uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, tar Barrara with uh, Giuliani. Today. Is he uh, overstepping his bounds? I, I, I like what he's saying. I do too. Because he expresses a frustration that many people have. Um, Is it appropriate for a prosecutor to be doing that? Absent anyone else doing it, Bob? Yes. <laughs> no, uh, no one else is, is talking about it. I mean, that, that's the problem, is that, you know, he, he has ventured into new territory, no question about it, but no one was going there. And others have had the authority to act, and they have failed to act. And so what are we to do as New Yorkers, just stand on the sideways, uh, sign lines and throw up our hands? No. I, I'm thankful that someone has come forward uh, and really... Uh, pushed the envelope here and raised the questions and going after state government because it hasn't been able to do it itself. And he's also pushed the media to, to do investigative journalism because there are things that are out there that investigative journalists can actually find and write about and bring to light that they could then make reforms over or lead to prosecutions rather than waiting for a federal prosecutor to, to, do, to do that job. And although the governor, we did change some ethics, ethics bills laws recently, not very few... County DAs have brought any 
corruption cases to bear on legislators. Why is that, Michael? <laughs> it's because, I think it's because DAs are themselves politicians. Well, no, the, the problem is, is that, you know, our local district attorneys have the power to pursue political corruption, but they also depend upon the very political machine that puts them in office. And so they're going to go after the people who put them in office? Uh, no. But it's do you kind want of a direct selection of district attorneys? Uh, Competitive examinations? No, but I think there are other ways in which to, uh, you know, uh, give uh, the power to uh, pursue public corruption. I mean, the attorney general uh, should have greater power than he. Right. Uh, he but currently yeah, has. you know, I, I mean, Barrar is on the side of the angels. I mean, without regard, you know, to the tactics. But then, along comes a less enlightened president who appoints a less enlightened U.S. attorney, who points to these procedures and said, "Well, it was okay when Barrar did it for what he thought were good things." Uh, so I can engage in prosecutorial well, those, that's access. That's the kind of argument that was made about Chris Christie when he was U.S. attorney in northern, in northern New Jersey, that he was politically motivated in his investigations that would get dropped right after Bob Menendez in particular was reelected. All of a sudden, right. the investigation disappeared. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, uh, 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 New Jersey is a cesspool equal to New York. But uh, well, you know, we always said that we had the best politicians money could buy. They just well, they have the worst. Not to be not to be that <laughs> yeah, good sometimes. Okay. And, you know, I do want to say that, and I, I think Dick, you're the best one to talk about this. Is that we're beating up on the assembly. Uh, some of the same questions about uh, the clients of Dean Skelos, the Senate Majority Leader, um, Senator Senator Libus, who's one who's a very senior guy within the Senate. I believe has been indicted. Is that, is that he has right? been indicted? The, sec the second we're part. lying though. But are we unfairly picking on the? I mean, are we unfairly picking on the assembly? No, I don't think we're unfairly picking on the assembly. But I mean, uh, you know, I, when we pick on the legislature, I'm picking on both the Senate and the mm -hmm. assembly. Right. I'm not singling out uh, the the, legis uh, the assembly. But you know, a third of all legislators make you know income in excess of twenty thousand dollars, and there's about. Twenty of them, uh, most of whom income are in the Senate. outside their outside their uh, uh, legislative right. I, I, salary. I'll tell you, uh, uh, more legislators make more money as a percentage. Uh, more state senators make a percent uh, more money in outside income than assembly members, mm -hmm. and that's because of their lucrative law practices. Right, that's the other. Well, uh, the law. You know, one of the critical factors has, in fact, been whether uh, lawyers should be required to lawyers who are legislative should be required to identify their clients because their clients have the potential be, to be tapping into the public purse that those lawmakers control. Uh, there's also a legal ethic that, of confidentiality and, and proprietary information that goes to the, to the relationship. There's a, um, that, that you know, goes to the relationship between a lawyer and his right. client. Um, and the city is bar... That, is that bridgeable? Yes, it is. I mean, the city yeah. bar... And the New York City Bar Association, the professional association of lawyers here in New York City, uh, even before the 2011 uh, ethics law was passed, basically said that legislative, uh, legislators who are lawyers can disclose uh, their clients. Uh, there needs to be protections in place, but uh, legislators can disclose their clients and should disclose their clients for the very reasons you mentioned. Um, is yeah. that... I'm sorry, go ahead. But there's one point I wanted to make that Dick has talked about raising the salaries of legislators, that's very, that's very important. Because when you look at the assembly members who themselves have been convicted of crimes, it hasn't been because they're outside income. It's because they've been looking for an outside income because they're so lowly paid. So the pay is so low. And because most, many of them have been minorities, black and Latino, uh, to, a, to a great extent, unfortunately. And it has nothing to do with, with their outside income. It's, it's, it's their own lack of ethics. It's the fact that because in those days, you aren't able to attract the really good people to run for office because the salary is, is so low, uh, so it could re recently raise a family. I think if you raise the salaries, we can get some of the bottom feeders that are in public office out of office mm -hmm. and really elect really good men and women to represent those districts and I think begin to, I, to, to I, raise I, the caliber. I, I do think, I'm yeah. going to turn to you, because I do think it's important to say, with a salute to David Dinkins, that there is a gorgeous mosaic of corruption that, you know, we've had yeah. Irish, Jewish, Italian, Seminario, uh, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, mm -hmm. African-Americans, Caribbeans. So there is a gorgeous mosaic quality to the uh, people who have been uh, thrown out of office. <laughs> I, I think to, to um, uh, further uh, this point in terms of, you know, uh, public service and particularly elected service, 
is one of the only um, positions in this country that we want we don't want people to be there very long but we want them to be the best um, right and so one who believes you know I personally don't believe in term limits because I believe like in any other career in, you know if you have public servants who uh, are can represent their constituents well um, who are not corrupt and sort of do it there's no reason why they should you know their constituents shouldn't reelect them to be there to represent them they have term um, limits every two years <laughs> right okay. Right. You know, and so um, so I don't believe, you know, um, uh, I don't believe in term limits overall. Um, but to this point, in, in certain districts across uh, the city, and particularly when you're talking about diversifying who represents districts across um, any position, um, we have to look at the barriers that exist that prevents people from running. Um, money is definitely um, a, a huge barrier that exists for women, um, for community, for uh, people of color who are looking to um, work in uh, public office, and it's not only raising money, um, but then also being able to, uh, to continue their uh, public uh, service. And so that's something as we're talking about reform, we have to make sure that in an effort to sort of, you know, have the best reform possible that we're not also continuing um, to limit those who are able to uh, join public service. Let me take a question. Tell us your name and the campus you're from. My name is Raymond Renaletta. I'm with Brooklyn College. And my question is, uh, for a joy cliff. Uh, earlier in the conversation, uh, the moderator had asked you what uh, your opinion was in regard to Governor Cuomo. And while you that was really unfair on the, on the moderator's part, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 elaborated more uh, on the system, but as far as what your opinion was uh, on the question that you were asked, I was wondering if you might elaborate. So <laughs> I'm not sure that. <laughs> You're asking my opinion on the governor? As, as far as the governor and if he's had any involvement in anything that is not on the up and up. Oh, well, that's... Uh, well, I, I mean, I can't answer that specifically right. to say, you know, specifically that uh, the governor is corrupt or that I have any evidence of that. Uh, I, or so indication. I can't, or, or any indication of that. Um, you know, the, the reason why I answered that way um, is particularly because he c currently occupies the office of governor and of the executive office. And so as you are leading and leading the charge or attempting to lead the charge on reform, that uh, shining the light internally um, is important to demonstrate uh, that you are actually committed to this change, not only for others, but also for yourself. Um, I don't think it's fair to, for us to sit here in judgment of somebody. No, Go ahead. Um, no but, I, but I think that, uh, to follow up on Joy's point, uh, the governor should lead by example uh, and should, you know, make sure that all the ethics proposals that he's made apply to his office as well. Well, I mean, uh, are there ones that can you point to anything? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Of course I do. Uh, <laughs> are there anything, anything you can point to that would raise that, raise your antenna? Uh, the earning of outside income. Uh, on the book? Yeah. I mean, on anything. On I mean, there's, there's no limits on what a governor could earn on outside income. Uh, but he is, you know. But yet, the governor, if, if I'm not mistaken, the governor is not allowed to have an outside job. Is that is that's that correct? correct. That's Lawmakers right. can, but the governor cannot. Right. right. Strange. Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and your campus, please. Hi. Good evening. My name is Cassie Rocha, and I'm from John Jay College. My question is regarding the Moreland Commission. Excellent. Will there ever be a state ethics commission that can investigate without a conflict of interest of those it is investigating? And would a completely outside commission even be possible? Excellent question, Dick. It's up your alley. Sure. I mean, the Moreland Commission was formed to essentially... Assemblyman Samuel Moreland in 1910, by the way. Yeah. Was, you know, was, it, it, it's an authority invested in the governor to look at uh, abuses... Uh, and corruption within executive agencies. And the way he was looking at the legislature was through the Board of Elections, where the campaign finance filings are, and through the JCOP, which, uh, control, which is now joint, joint oversight of the, right. the ethics for the uh, executive and, and legislative branch. But, but he couldn't look at the legislature overall. You know, what we have right now in terms of uh, ethics enforcement is JCOP, the Joint Commission on Public Ethics, which has gubernatorial and legislative appointment appointees to it. But they are they do not have the full power that we would like to see them have. They don't have the full independence. In a quirk, uh, you know, it's a, a 14 member body and if the three legislative members of the same party vote against 
uh, a decision to start an investigation, the investigation dies. Three of 14. Uh, and it's, you know, we need to change the voting structure. We need to give it greater independence because I think it really wants to go after some of this corruption but can't because of the way it is structured. Uh, the legislature still has the authority to prosecute when cases are identified and findings are made and, uh, and uh, a report is issued. We would like to see that taken away from the legislature. Well, there is a and the legislature yeah. should only have the power to assign penalties. Well, I mean, uh, of course, you do have an outside prosecutor in this case, Barrara, who does not have those kinds of restrictions on, on him, where he can stick his nose, where he can follow his nose wherever he right. wants to But follow. the day-to-day -day enforcement should be done in a much more effective way uh, through a greater independent agency. And the key is through reporting. The key is, right. again, sunshine. I mean, that's but we're also forgetting campaign finance. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the governor has not been leading by example. He's mm -hmm. raised an obscene amount of money two years ago to run for re-election. And he would not impose limits on himself, even though his opponent had barely able to raise a dollar himself. Um, the governor hasn't worked on that. He's been rather secretive about how money is spent in the various authorities and who his campaign donors are and if any of them have benefited from actions taken by his government. And without having the sunshine to see that, we should raise questions about what, he's been, what, he, what his donors, how they have benefited. I mean, oh, this is probably for another show, but, you know, I've always wondered, there's a, there's a horse and cart question, a chicken and egg question. Do people give money expecting favors, or do people give money to people who they think agree with them? And that's one of the hardest things to... I think neither. You know. I mean, I think some, yes, but I think the main thing is that people give money to make sure they've got access. Right, right. Um, and well, access is not a decision. Right, exactly. But they want to be sure that they will have the attention or the interest of the person. Whether they can ultimately convince the decision maker is another uh, uh, situation entirely. But uh, given the amount of money that gets raised, everybody gets feels this pressure like, well, if he's contributing and she's contributing, I better contribute because I'm going to be left out. Uh, if I'm not a contributor. And so everybody contributes as business before the state because they want to make sure they've got the attention Which of the decision Which is part maker. of why the city system is so brilliant, of limiting contributions, Correct. public matching, limiting, limiting spending. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Sandra May Flowers from Hunter College. And with such low voter enthusiasm for the state politics at the current time, how can we make ethics a more prominent issue? Well, it certainly is a prominent issue now. <laughs> I mean, in terms of press coverage and, you know, public attention, which is often driven by the press. I mean, one of the problems is that New York City, I've made this point before in this show, is fully a creation of Albany, and they could vote us out of existence tomorrow. It's kind of like in the 1980s when the, when the wars were going on in Central America, and people would say well, Americans will do anything about anything for Central America except read about it. Um, it's only at times like this that there is this kind of spotlight Right. on Albany. Um, I think to, uh, um, to yeah. her point as well um, is sort of the, the greater conversation of voter apathy and sort of what, uh, how these corruption or um, pushes for reform sort of contribute to that. Um, there are lots of different reasons uh, that voters feel apathetic. <laughs> there are lots of different reasons as to why more people don't participate in the process. Uh, corruption or the appearance of corruption being a small portion of that. Um, and so I, I think as we continue to push uh, reform, I think that more people will, you know, seek to be involved in the process or at least see that there, there is a voice for them in the process overall. Yeah. I think that, that corruption actually is easy to understand and, and people can get their arms around it. I mean, I mean, we all know what a crook is. It's not a matter of, of thinking about abstractions and the kinds of things that you think about with regard to uh, I issues that you haven't experienced with the, pro the political process itself. Uh, those are much tougher. And ethics r involved in the process that don't involve money are the things that we can't get attention paid to. And I think that's where the problem is. The other, the other issues you have, too, because of what you said, when you have voter apathy and low turnout, people who are corrupt, at least have been accused of corruption, get reelected. It ha it's happened well, a, a, a number of Well, there's a vicious cycle, and then people turn off because of the corruption, and less people right, are going right, to vote. Right. So, but, I mean, but, it's but kind the, of a... But, but the voter also has a responsibility. I have this, this weird distinction having been 
preceded by a person who was corrupt and convicted and sent to jail. My successor was indicted and convicted and is now serving time in jail. So what happened to you? Why, you, why were you so clean? That's you got right. out. <laughs> I, had, I had constituents who always said to me, Michael, are you staying honest? He, they took it upon themselves because of what happened to my predecessor to take it upon themselves to ask that question, to be the ones probing and making sure this guy I'm putting my trust and vote in that he is staying honest. So voters can do other kinds of things too to do that. And, in, and when you have people who vote, you, you get more voters, you can get more competition, and you can possibly oust people like Pedro Espada. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. My name's Amanda Dunn, and I go to Queens College, and I just want to know uh, why, you, if you guys think it's fiscally responsible for the governor to put the New York State budget on the line for ethics. Um, for example, the, the governor might use his executive budgeting power as a threat against a legislator to enact these reforms. Well, I mean, the kind of linkage that we've talked about. It is a, when you, it's kind of an omnibus legislation with disconnected things. I mean, I mean uh, it's uh, unacceptable for him to have taken this action. It's an ends justify the means argument. Uh, yeah, but, but I can understand his frustration uh, because I'm just as frustrated with the fact that the legislature has not passed the kind of comprehensive ethics reform that would, that would result in uh, preventing a lot of what's been going on. I mean, arguably, Shelley Silver uh, and others have been tripped up as a result of the reforms that happened in 2011. And so just imagine, I mean, if we do succeed in passing stronger ethics reforms, we may see more corruption come out because there will be more opportunities to catch it, and it will take a while for the system to clean itself out as a result of the new ethics reforms. Yeah, actually, it's neither fiscally responsible nor ethically responsible. I mean, it's not fiscally responsible because nobody's paying attention to the budget. Everybody's paying attention to the, to the ethics question. And it's not ethically responsible because it subverts democracy. Other than that, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Michael Fabre from John Jay College. My question to you is, how can we strengthen the protection against conflicts of interest when prosecuting for ethic violations? And in regards to the case of Mr. Silver, I'm sure he has a lot of uh, connections all across the, the uh, judicial system. So how can we um, protect against uh, there that to make sure there's no going easy? Well, first of all, Silver's case is a federal case. And, you know, Silver's involvement to the degree uh, he was involved in the selection of judges, he was very close. He, he, he remains very close to the chief judge of the state of New York. But this is a federal case, and he has no role in naming the federal judges. But uh, does anybody have a take on that? No, I think you're right, Bob. I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the solution to preventing future Shelley Silver-like cases is greater disclosure, as we've talked about, and disclosing, you know, uh, the clients and disclosing the source of income in a way that he did not uh, as well, as, and, and limiting the kind of activity that is permitted in the earning of outside income, uh, you know, essentially forbidding any kind of uh, involvement with a firm that has business with the state. I think there has to be a reallocation of power as well. Uh, Definitely. You, know, you you can't from just, the leader controlled chapter. That's right. You you have got the three to men have, in the room, if you will. That's right. I mean not just the three men in the room. I mean that's gotta go. There should be conference committees, the governor should be forced to veto, uh, there should be overrides. Uh, but the the speaker and the majority leader should not have that kind of concentration. Just look at the number of lawyers on the speaker's staff as opposed to the number of lawyers on any committee staff. Uh, there's no way that, that uh, bills can become law without being fu structured by the Speaker's office, yeah. without regard to what happens in a committee. I mean, Ken's made a very good point, and Joy's made this point too, is that the legislature is, you know, a weaker uh, branch of government than the, than the executive, the governor. And part of the reason why we have these strong, uh, strong speaker and a strong majority leader is that you want to have the legislature be as strong as possible and as unified as possible so they invest all of their power in these two individuals, uh, where the real solution is to give more, is, to, is a constitutional change, mm -hmm. to give yeah. more power to the citizens' legislature, uh, the Assembly and the Senate, and uh, I think by doing that will lessen 
the ability of the speaker and the majority leader to hold the kind of Constitutionally, New York has an unusually strong governor. Right. Yeah. That's and, and the city has an unusually strong mayor, too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, there's always this contention, both with the city council and the mayor and, and, and then with the legislator. And just to, to sort of close out and sort of wrap up just in terms of um, Michael's point about the voters' responsibility, right? Because I think we, uh, we are also brought up to believe that our responsibility as voters is only participating in an election. Um, and then we're not taught very, uh, very much. It is not part of our regular civic education and how we continue to influence the system. We should really be demanding um, uh, reform across the board and not only uh, legisl you know, the legislature, but across the board in terms of how our government is run and sort of how uh, our money is spent and how laws are passed and what issues we take, we take upon. Again, we have an antiquated system um, that has... Uh, um, it, we've kind of outgrown um, that we need to change in order that we have a more transparent and representative system. Transparency is the absolute essential key. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Christina Brown. I attend Brooklyn College. And my question is, uh, time and time again, we see, we've seen ethics reform crumble due to the fact that those who are in power don't want to pull back the curtain of their own faults. So my question is, what are the roles of nonprofits and non-governmental organizations in ethics reforms? Kind of more, more broadly, how much is public pressure going to force change on people who might not want to change otherwise? Well, and public pressure is the only leverage that we have right now other than the U.S. attorney. Because and you're not going to vote him out of office. You know, the realities, mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, death indictment or becoming a judge. And, you know, a, a, a lot of nonprofits, uh, including Citizens Union, that serve as good government watchdogs, issue reports, you know, highlight the problems that exist. We uncover corruption. We uncover, you know, I mean, we, Citizens Union on its website, as this corruption tracker that you alluded to earlier at the beginning, citizensunion.org, you know, it shows uh, in very detailed fashion the 28 legislators and why they left office. It's that kind of public pressure. It's those kind of reports, that kind of data crunching, you know, whether it comes to campaign finance reports, uh, you know, having a very strong and effective media uh, helps to keep uh, the system as honest as possible. You know, I think there's a cauldron of activity going on right now as a result of all this corruption that could be explosive and could result in some meaningful change. Because everybody knows that the media is ethical. Uh, <laughs> well, you were when you were, I mean. Well, when I was there, it was And you still are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I had 27 arrests and no convictions. I had a perfect <laughs> record. Yes. My name is Shakira Rincon from John Jay College. Um, my question is for Dick Dady. Um, how do you believe outside income can be limited, um, limited other than increasing member compensation? How do, you, how do members disregard outside income that was there before being elected? Very good question. I mean, I'm, I happen to be very suspicious, not suspicious, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of limiting outside site income. I'm utterly comfortable and think it's required absolutely increasing reporting. But the, but the question of limiting, by limiting income, are you limiting who can, who will serve? No, because it, it, you cannot just address one piece of this puzzle and expect it to solve the problem, uh, which is why you need to increase legislative pay. Uh, significantly. Uh, you want to have the ability of the legislators to continue to earn outside income, but you want, we believe that you should limit it. And why should you limit it? Because when you enter public life, you are taking on a significant role as a result of earning the public trust during an election. You cannot serve conflicting or different masters. You only can serve one master, and that is the public. Uh, for you to be, you know, uh, but even working on at, behalf of your constituents at, and then looking, turning around and, and working on behalf of uh, clients who are interested in influencing state government action, that's a conflict. But what, about something but, what, like, but what about something like Bloomberg who put his money into a blind trust? I mean, this is the man who had economic interests everywhere. Is that a means of and letting people who've built up assets have those assets perform for them while they're in public office? Yes. Or what about a, a, a legislator being in public office and then being, you know, a professor at a college? Or, or a minister. Or, or, or a, a, a preacher. Right, right. yeah. Right. So there, there are many different, and I agree with you, that sort of makes you a little bit uncomfortable in terms of uh, limiting people's ability to yeah. um, their pursuit of happiness, as you should say. Um, and so there, there, there is that um, apprehension overall. Yeah. But, but, but you can't have two But most places actually 
work full time as legislators. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Even the, though it's a part-time The part great time majority job. work, work full time. Right. So for me, it's, it's a question of, well, how many hours in a day do you have and in a week to work, do significant outside income unless you're an attorney? Right. And then they are also so few in the legislature Increasingly. who make right. that, much, that much money. But I think it really should be about transparency, proper reporting, and, and encouraging people to serve and then leave after 8, 10, or 12 years. Why and leave? That, only, only because I believe there are persons who have particular kinds of uh, personalities where the longer they serve in office, the more they're feeding their ego and they become arrogant and it leads to corrupt practices among some people. Um, but you and, should, the leave is voluntary, not right, forced? Right. Yeah, Lunch is voluntary. I, I wouldn't force it, but I think people should impose their own term limits. Serving 45 years in the assembly, to me, makes no sense when you haven't had real outside experience with the rest of your, of your constituents. So this is legislative self-deportation, is that it? <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily draw that. But, but I mean, but we do have That's term limits every, yes. we have potential term limits every. But the defeat of, of incumbents is, 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 is we, impossible. Yeah, our 97% re-election rate, and the, and the reason we have that is because of the powers of incumbency, but also because we lack uh, campaign finance reform here in the state, Absolutely. and money drives, the, drives the, all these decisions. Um, taking a historical view, we're, we only have a minute left. Um, let's, you know, we want to go back to the Seabury investigations. I mean, where, you know, how far back do we, do we want to go? Is there's a, are we spinning our wheels? Are we going to face this same uh, crisis atmosphere, or will will things go back back to normal? I mean, take a take a historical perspective. Bob, I, I'm a I'm a I, I'm a good government advocate, so by my very nature, I'm an optimist, and so you know I got to believe that this is going to be the game changer. It has to be, uh, you know, in a way that. We should not accept anything less than a full loaf, and I think the governor's committed to it, even if we question his his, mot his uh, uh, approach. And with having uh, Preet Bharara, you know, breathing down everyone's neck, uh, saying that uh, Preet Bharara saying, "Stay tuned," right? And we will stay tuned. So uh, I want to thank everybody. Uh, this was a very spirited discussion, and um, we will see you next time on the CUNY Forum. Thank you all. Thank you. All right.